Welcome back. And today we're going to talk a little about Green's functions on subsets of R. If you remember, this series started with talking about subsets of R and the Chebyshev polynomials. So let's talk about what E is. Well, E, we said from the beginning, is compact in R. and infinite. So it's not just a few points. And generally speaking, we're going to want E nonpolar, E to have positive capacity. And all countable sets are polar, so we'll deal with E being uncountable. Now, if, that, if we ever want to deal with other examples, we can. But we're going to do this for now. If we want to ever deal with small sets, E, e that is polar, we would be allowed. But most of the time, they're going to be nonpolar. So we'll split up E into E0 union XI from i equals 1 to m. m is somewhere in 0 to infinity. And by that I mean that e naught is regular, which is the same as saying that the Green's function is 0 on e naught. And the xi are all irregular. So the xi can be at most a polar set. Now, we are sort of assuming countable in this case. There's no rule that says that the irregular part has to be uncountable. But most of the time it will be because if it's uncountable, it gets so large that most of the results we have just fall apart very quickly. And so we'll address that as it comes up. So that's a refresh of what we have here. Little piece of vocabulary. A gap of E is a bounded connected component of R without E. So that basically means an interval. Uh, bounded and connected component, that has to be an interval. So let's say E were like this. Then our gaps, it would be here's one, here's one, and here's one. Okay. So we want to now talk about some of what happens when the Green's function in the gaps is really what we're interested in. That's going to be sort of our focus right now. So I want to start off with this. Let's pick some xi or x1 that is not part of E. So let's draw this path here. And we'll pick an arbitrary point here that is x1 plus i, y. And now we'll define a function here. Well, no, let's not talk about defining functions. Let's pick a separate point, t, that is inside e. Now what I hope is obvious is that this distance here is less than this distance here. So the absolute value of x1 minus t 
is less than the absolute value of x1 plus iy minus t. So we could take the reciprocal log x1 minus t will be greater than the log of 1 over x1 plus iy minus t. And then if we rearrange a little bit and maybe take an integral, we can then say the integral of log of 1 over x1 minus t with respect to the equilibrium measure of t is greater than the integral of the log of 1 over x1 minus, uh, let me make sure I'm saying this right, minus t plus i y d mu e t. And this is the triangle inequality here that set this up. But it's also because of the actual triangle, you can kind of see it. Well, what if we got here then? This is the same as saying the potential of x1 is greater than the potential of x1 plus iy. Maybe I should not have rearranged those in the first place. Maybe I should have just left them. But we can see that I think this over here on the right is the potential at x1 plus iy if we just switch these two things around. It doesn't really make much difference, but Okay, um, yeah, yeah, it's just a couple different ways of writing it. It's the same thing. So the point of all this is that the potential reaches a maximum here, which is the same as saying that the Green's function reaches a minimum there. It will not be zero, probably, because we're not in E. But that means that if we were to do something like this. Let's say the Green's function on E, of x1 plus i y. So what we're saying here is that we can just treat this as a function of y alone, because x1 is fixed. Now the trick with a lot of this subject is going to be switching between real and complex numbers. So let's say right now this is r. And this is the Green's function, which is also an R. What we've just said is that GEY will have a minimum when Y equals zero. Or Y is a horizontal line here, and the value of the Green's function is the vertical we'll have a minimum somewhere here where y is zero. Well, if you remember your first semester calculus, if this function from real to real has a minimum, that means g y y is positive. But another thing we know about the Green's function is it's harmonic when we're not in E, and x1 is not in E. So therefore, g e of x, if instead of looking at y, we go along x, well, because of harmonicity, gxx at x1 has got to be negative. So, 
that result is going to be very useful and very important to us in the not too distant future because it implies that on a gap of E, so let's imagine like a little gap here, I'm a little sideways just because of the way my writing tablet works. We know the Green's function will probably be zero there and zero there. G can have a max, but no min. So take this in. This is probably the most important thing we're doing right now, or at least one of, I'm not sure if that's true, but it probably is. As we look at the Green's function, just traveling along the real axis, not even really noticing what type of the imaginary, because of the harmonicity, the double x derivative has got to be negative, which means we could go up and come back down, but that's it. We could not, for instance, go up and down and up and down again because this point here would be a minimum, which would make g double x be positive. So that's impossible. So this fact here we will use in the big proof that we're gearing up to. On any gap of E, G can have a max but no min. And even and this is a max, as in one max, one and only one. Because if you had two maxes, you'd have to have a min in between them. Okay. What else do we know? Well, let's name z of g is g inverse of 0. The set of points of the Green's function is 0. Now, we know that e naught is part of cg. That's just by definition. e naught is... We know that the Green's function must equal 0 on most of e. And e naught we're defining as the part where it is equal to 0. Now, are there isolated points in CG? Is such a thing possible? Well, I contend it is not, for some of the same reasons that we've been doing. So, hmm. now where we get stuck here though, we're talking about gaps of E, but gaps of E could be defined by isolated points. Let's step back for a second. I'm going to make another claim, which is a little bold, but I'm going to say that the Green's function of E is the same as the Green's function of E naught. Is that true? Well, think about our characterization for Green's function. G E naught is harmonic outside E naught. So it's harmonic all the same places as E is. Um, these, most these must both turn into log Z as we go out. And our rule is that for almost every zeta in E, quasi every, the limit of the Green's function equals zero. So my point here is that 
since the Green's function is zero at every point in E naught, it is also zero at almost or quasi every point in E. So they fit the same criteria. So I'm going to say then that we can use these interchangeably. Essentially, what we're saying here is that a Green's function is allowed a certain amount of exceptions. This has no exceptions to the zero rule. This has some, but not very many. And so it, GE, works as a Green's function for GE naught and vice versa. Because the difference between them is small enough that it can be ignored. All right, so I think this is going to help my isolated point argument. Here are my wrestling papers there. Hmm. So G E naught of X. equals zero at an isolated point. Suppose that were true. So we'd have some point here, x, where it's zero. That means it is not zero around it. Well, I think we see the contradiction already. Then that means x is a minimum. X would have to be a minimum, and we know those don't exist. Now, I know technically it doesn't have to be harmonic here if that's part of E, but look around. It's still going to be concave up near there. So we cannot have any isolated points of the zero set. Let me make sure that this is clear about this. I feel like I rushed through that a bit. So let's say we assume g of x equals 0 and g of x is not 0 on some interval x minus delta x plus delta. So assume that were true, then since the Green's function is never negative, it must be that g of x is greater than g of y for every y in x minus delta x plus delta, which would mean that g of x is a local minimum. And we've already established that that's impossible. And the reason it's impossible comes because of harmonicity. And like I said, I I got myself thrown off a little bit because I earlier when I was thinking about this one, if this is x, if x is in E, then it's not harmonic there. But it would still have to be harmonic nearby. It would still have to be concave down nearby, uh, concave up nearby, and that would be the same contradiction. Now, it's not a problem for it to be zero on a single point at the edge of a gap, and the reason is because here is part of E naught that it's touching, it'll be flat there. It'll be zero all along there. And then go up. This is not a local minimum because it's equal on the left side. So that's fine. I think we also showed that the Green's function is non-zero outside of the real line. That if we have E being some set of the real line. Whatever it is. 
the greens function has got to be positive outside of it. And I don't think the proof we used for that really involved the idea of um, being outside of E. So that should be fine. Now, I wanted to talk a little more about the zero set. Oh, yeah, I did want to say, let's say here's a gap of E. We said Green's function can't be zero at an isolated point. Could it be zero on a whole interval inside of a gap? Could the Green's function be zero all along there? Well, no. And again, it becomes because of harmonicity. If this were the case, if this were a function, we could see the Green's, the derivative would be zero. So the second derivative would also be zero, which would mean the y derivative, double derivative, would also be zero as well. That's harmonicity. If the double x derivative is zero, the double y derivative is zero. And then that would lead to a contradiction of the first thing we did, that along this path, this needs to be a minimum, meaning the g double y should be positive. So we just said that g of x plus i y has got to be non-zero for y not equal to zero. The Green's function cannot be zero off the real line, whereas it must be zero on most of E. And it will not be zero on far that side. I... I don't think I showed this in a previous video, so I'm going to hit it right now, which is, say this is all parts of E, we could define what's called a convex whole of E to basically be the interval that contains E. So it's all this here would be E. And then the Green's function would not be zero this way either, for much the same reason that we can't have g double x ever be negative so as it leaves it starts going up no sorry did i say that wrong it should actually always be negative that would mess up if we tried to do that tried to go back down it's also just because of the way it was defined. Maybe it's an even easier way to say this. X1 minus T, like that. I think this is a clear way to do it. Just use a similar proof to what we did at the beginning. If we pick an X1, then go out to X2, the distances are getting larger and larger, which means the potential we'll have to keep decreasing as we go farther out, which means the Green's function will keep increasing. Um, yeah, that's not beautiful, but it's similar enough to the one earlier that I trust you could work it out on your own if you want to. So, what we've said is that Z of G contains No isolated points or intervals in E complement. Now, it does contain intervals in E itself. It probably does, at least. If E has an interval, we would expect the Green's function to be zero on most of that. And that's not a problem because the definition of Green's function does not require it to be harmonic inside of E. So our rule about saying, so here the GXX would be zero, but that does not require GYY to be zero because we're not required to be harmonic inside of E. Okay, now
ZG contains no isolated points, and E0 is contained in ZG. That I was about to say that means E naught does not contain isolated points. Now that I think about it, I'm not sure that's true. So I'm not yeah, I'm not sure I can make that conclusion yet. But I do want to do a little more about ZG. Specifically, ZG is necessarily closed because it is the pre-image of a singleton which is closed and G is continuous. So that means that Z of G is what's called a perfect set. And so normally we think of those as being intervals. They are closed, they contain no isolated points. But it could be something really more exotic, like, say, a Cantor set. Cantor sets are weird, but they're fun. Could it be zero on a whole Cantor set outside of E? I'm really not sure. I am thinking about it. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But I think that will be something we will look at as we go. So I'm trying to think. Is there anything else I need to say? I think we're good. All right, I'll see you next time.